Let's talk about chapter 5.5, which is about numerical integration. Uh, let's start out with some uh, discussion of why it's important. So in the big homework file here, I have a section uh, that's not actual homework yet. It's just motivation. Um, so we use numeric integration in a bunch of different cases. Uh, pharmacokinetics is an important one where we've got data on how much of a medicine is in someone's body as time goes on. And we'll do an example of that in Excel in just a little bit. Um, if you've got acceleration data, you can turn that into velocity data and then again to position data. Uh, so this is the kind of when you have data section rather than formulas. Um, uh, you can use it for inertial navigation, figuring out where you are based on where you started and how you've accelerated since then, even without GPS. Um, and you'll see in a project how well that tends to work. Uh, you, even if you don't have data, you can use numeric integration to solve a differential equation that has no formula solution at all. Uh, we've already seen that in the diabetes blood sugar insulin project. Um, if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, I recommend you do. It's based on this book, which is a really good one too. Um, uh, so that's about the space race in the 1950s and NASA and solving part of it is about solving differential equations. Um, and in fact, numeric integration is part of the reason that com electronic computers were invented back in World War II. The ENIAC was the first big electronic computer, and the NI in ENIAC stands for numeric integration. Um, here's a photo of the machine back then, um, and these women are the programmers, and there's even a kid's book about that called Women Who Launched the Computer Age. Uh, so uh, all kinds of interesting stuff here. Um, also, uh, even mechanical computers in the 1800s were invented to do numerical integration. Uh, if you're looking for a graphic novel that's about 20% reality and 80% just going crazy with fiction and has footnotes on footnotes on footnotes of historical stuff, um, I really recommend this one called The Thrilling Adventures of Lovelace and Babbage. Um, and then a third reason we do numerical integration, the first one was when you have data but no formulas. The other one, the second one was when you have um, formulas for the derivative, but there's no, uh, but you can't get the antiderivative because it's a differential equation. And sometimes you have a formula that you'd like the integral of, um, but there is literally no formula antiderivative of it. So the bell curve function e to the negative x squared is a classic example. Um, if you think you can take the antiderivative, you might guess that it's this. We might guess that it's that, but when you take the derivative, it just doesn't work. So those are the big uses of numerical integration. Um, and now we're going to turn to paper and pencil stuff. And if you're reading this in the big homework file, the next section is the actual homework for numerical integration. So here's an example of a curve we might want to take the integral of. And let's say it's just a small section of a much larger uh, integration that we're doing. So we wouldn't want to just draw a box to estimate the area under the curve from here to there. Um, so we could uh, say, let's use a left side box like that. And you know, it's better than nothing, right? We could say, let's use a right side box. So have a height equal to the maximum height there, and then draw our box down like that. You might be thinking this is awfully similar to the upper bound and lower bound that I keep advocating. But is there a way to compute the area under the curve using some familiar geometric shape that's better than both the uh, right side box here and the left side box? Well, you might say, let me connect, um, or do it in kind of another color, let me connect those two dots with a straight line, that's going to come a lot closer to the curve um, than either the top box or the bottom box. And what shape do I get if I do that? I'm getting a shape with a slanted top, straight sides, and a, um, directly across base. So I'm getting a shape basically like this, which is a trapezoid. And what's the area of a trapezoid? Well, I know we've talked about this in another video, but it doesn't hurt to think about it again. So I can call this height one and height two, and call this uh, the width. So the area of the trapezoid Think about it before I write it down. Ready? 
it's height 1 plus height 2 over 2 times the width, which you could think of as the average of the height 1 with the height 2 times the width. Um, and a good way to think about that is what if I had um, averaged the top box and the bottom box here, I would get what we've traditionally drawn as our uh, guess box. You've got my purple pen here. Uh, that's halfway between the top and the bottom. And the area of that trapezoid is the same as if I took that line and rotated it so it still went through that center point, but then touched the diagonal, uh, then went from that corner to that corner. You can see that the triangle you get here ends up kind of canceling the triangle you would get over here. Um, so that's a nice way to think of the average vertically of those two being the same as doing that trapezoid. So how are we going to do this in a spreadsheet? That's the eternal question, right? Um, so let's do it this way. Let's say we're doing f of x equals x squared. So in this case, we have a function. We could take the antiderivative ourselves. That's kind of an easy one. Um, but let's suppose that uh, it was a more complicated formula sometime in the future. Um, so we'd have maybe a column for x uh, where we could go like negative 4, negative 3.9, negative 3.8, etc. Um, you could compute delta x right there. So what's your delta x based on those two? It would be positive 0.1, right? Um, you could have f of x equals x squared. Um, so in this row it would be 16. For negative 4 squared is positive 16. Negative 3.9 squared is 15-ish. Exact answer isn't too important right now. And then um, in previous chapters, chapter 5.3 in particular, I had another column for box area or trapezoid area, um, but this time I'm going to kind of smooth over that or just glide over it and put it all into one with the cumulative area so far. Um, so I'll we'll say cumulative area so far. That does two things. It helps uh, save a column on a spreadsheet, um, which can be handy if you've got lots of columns going on. And it makes it actually a little bit easier to think about, am I doing left, right, or midpoint? Um, so I'd say our cumulative area so far, starting at negative, uh, sorry, left, right, or trapezoid, um, starting at negative four, ending at negative four is zero, because you've gone zero width so far. And then in the next row, I'd say take that previous cumulative so far and add the new trapezoid uh, size area. What's the size of the new trapezoid? Well, its width is 0.1, and what's, what do I multiply that by? By the average of the two heights, previous row and this row. So I can say average. In Excel, literally, you can say the word average, and then in parenthesis, and then highlight those two boxes and put that cell reference there, and then say times the delta x value here. And so that's saying take the previous value multi and add the height or the area of the new trapezoid, which is the average of these two heights times the width. If you wanted to do left, instead of taking the average of these two, you would take, just take the first one, because the left comes first in our usual number line. If you want to do the right method, the right side method, you would, instead of saying average, you would just use the 15-ish, not the 16 or the average. So it makes it easy to switch from left, right, and trapezoid um, by, by thinking about it this way. And then you would just take that and fill down. And now the question is, what's your final answer? Well, it depends. Are we asking for a curve, like the value of the cumulative area so far at each step of the way, then this entire column is your answer. Um, that's kind of the indefinite integral, right? So if you graph that whole column, versus the x column, 
what you get is the integral 0 to x, you could say f of t dt, as a function, which is kind of like an indefinite integral, but without the plus c. The plus c has kind of already been decided. It's whatever you need to make that value 0. It's not necessarily 0 or negative 4 or 16 or whatever. Um, but it, you could say it's like an indefinite integral. Um, if you have a definite integral, like the integral from negative 4 to positive 2 or something, um, so if you have a definite integral, um, its estimated value is the last answer in the cumulative area so far column. It's not the sum of that entire column. And in previous uh, setups for spreadsheets, we had a column of individual box sizes, and you, we said you could sum all those up all at once at the end. Uh, here we don't even have that. Um, so we could say it's the uh, final value in the cumulative area so far. So um, I hope you agree that the trapezoid method is really not much more effort than the left side or the right side method. You're just saying take the average of these two um, and instead of just saying this one or that one, we're letting Excel take the average, that's easy enough. Um, so at this point, we basically want to use the trapezoid rule um, instead of the left or right me method because it's more accurate, as I hope you can see. I mean, in it's almost always more accurate. If you really wanted to, you could design a function where left was more accurate than trapezoid, um, but those are pretty rare in practice. Um, so trapezoid method, yay. Um, there is a trapezoid method in the book, um, and in many books, um, that has a formula uh, that I'll show in a sec. Um, It's something like uh, delta x times f of x1 plus 2 f of x2 plus 2 f of x3 plus dot 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 plus f of x n. And that's true, but it depends on the delta x being the same at every single step, and that's not always the case in real life. So I like this method because it can automatically handle when the delta x is the same or isn't the same. Um, but this one, if delta x isn't the same from, from time point to time point, you just get the wrong answer and there's no indication that it's wrong. Uh, so I like teaching this more general method here. Uh, this in some sense saves a little bit of computation because you're only doing the multiplication once. But this also just gives you one answer. This is the definite integral. It doesn't give you the cumulative area so far along the way. So um, we'll say, I might have this wrong. There might be like a one half out front or something. It doesn't matter. Um, I guess we'll put that in question marks. Um, so it depends on all the delta x's being the same. And it only gives one answer rather than a whole curve. So it gives actually less information than the method I'm suggesting here. Um, so it gives only the final answer, or only the final value, not the whole curve. So it is in some sense a shortcut, but it's a shortcut that misses a whole lot, and I really don't encourage anyone in my class using that. Next we'll talk about some pharmacokinetics.